so let me start by thanking the organisers for giving me this opportunity to uh, pull together my thoughts on the issue of sustainability accounting and carbon accounting. This is a, a radically new topic. Uh, 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, it didn't exist. Very few people were interested in it. Uh, but today, most large Western companies are pledging carbon neutrality within a couple of decades. Uh, and most governments are pledging massive reductions in their carbon emissions. And clearly a prerequisite for making any of this work is that we can record and measure the emissions of carbon. In other words, we have a system of carbon accounting. Uh, and being carbon neutral or being carbon zero implies that we know precisely where we are in terms of carbon emissions. So the demand for carbon accounting comes entirely from a combination of governmental insistence on reducing carbon emissions and from cor corporate moves to, to respond to this and to, to comply with government wishes to reduce carbon emissions. Um, and in order to do this, companies have to be able to measure their carbon emissions and they have to be able to model how various different choices, various different policies on their part would affect their carbon emissions. And finally, of course, we need, need to be able to audit any claims that uh, carbon emissions have been reduced. Uh, we need an independent assessment. We need to be able to give an independent assessment of how valid claims are to have reduced carbon emissions. So the um, way this works at the moment is that we have a so-called uh, greenhouse gas protocol, um, and uh, car companies' emissions of carbon dioxide and associated gases are divided into what we call the scopes one, two, and three. Scope one emissions are emissions from a company's own facilities. Scope two emissions are those from power purchased by the company. So if your company buys electricity, for example, and that electricity is generated by burning coal, then scope two emissions are the emissions from the coal used to generate electricity that the company purchases. And scope three emissions are emissions from elsewhere in the supply chain, <clears throat> its suppliers and its users. Now, the... Um, the this is best illustrated with some examples. So I've given you an example here of Exxon. Um, Exxon's scope one emissions are the emissions from its own operations. So Exxon has offices, it heats and cools its offices, it runs trucks, it runs aircraft, drilling equipment and so on. So the emissions from those are Exxon's scope one emissions. Exxon buys in electricity from uh, third parties and some of that will be generated by fossil fuels the emissions from that are Exxon Scope 2 emissions. And then Exxon Scope 3 emissions will mainly be those from the use of its refined products. So Exxon produces gasoline, which is burnt in cars and trucks. That produces emissions. Those are part of its Scope 3 emissions. Exxon produces jet fuel, which is burnt in aircraft. Again, that produces CO2 emissions, and those are part of Exxon Scope 3 emissions. There will be other Scope 3 emissions from elsewhere in its supply chain, but um, these are the principal emissions in the case of a company like Exxon. Here's a different example, American Airlines. <clears throat> American Airlines scope one emissions, or the emissions from its own operations. And again, that in this case will mean burning jet fuel in its aircraft, burning gasoline in its trucks, etc. American scope two emissions, again, are the emissions from the generation of electricity that it purchases. And its scope three emissions are those associated with its supply chain, which in this case will mean making its aircraft and its engines, uh, plus some others perhaps. And finally, I'm giving a third example here to tie these things together, just Pratt & Whitney, the jet, jet engine makers. Pratt & Whitney's scope one emissions are those associated with the operation of its plants again. Scope two emissions are again those associated with any electricity it purchases from third parties. And scope three emissions are mainly those from the operation of its engines. Uh, when its engines are operated in an aircraft, they burn a great deal of jet fuel and produce a lot of emissions. But there also will be some other emissions from its supply chain. For example, Pratt & Whitney will use a lot of aluminum, um, and that aluminum is, used, is produced using some rather energy-intensive processes. So there'll be emissions from that, and those emissions will be part of its scope through emissions. Now, think about these three examples I've given you, Exxon, American Airlines, and Pratt & Whitney. <coughs> um, one of the things is there's a huge amount of overlap in some of these emissions we've, looked, we've talked at here. Uh, and good accounting systems really don't double count. It's an absolute sort of sine qua non of an accounting system that never double counts anything. But if you think about what I've just been through, um, it's clear that any company's scope three emissions are going to be a utility's scope one emissions. Okay, and then Exxon's scope three emissions 
are American Airlines Scope 1 emissions, because Exxon Scope 3 emissions come from the combustion of its jet fuel, amongst other things, and that's been carried out by American Airlines in its aircraft, and so that's a Scope 1 emission for, for American Airlines. Then Exxon Scope 3 emissions are also, of course, Pratt & Whitney Scope 3 emissions, because Pratt & Whitney Scope 3 emissions are the combustion of come from the combustion of gasoline in its engines, um, and that's exactly what is uh, part of Exxon Scope 3 emissions. So we can see from this that the emissions from American Airlines aircraft have been counted three times. They've been counted as American Airlines Scope 1 emissions, and they've been counted as Scope 3 for Exxon and for Pratt & Whitney. And so adding these three things up will give a very misleading impression of total emissions. And actually, more importantly, from a policy perspective, any reduction is going to be counted three times. So suppose, for example, American Airlines uses more efficient engines or it routes its aircraft more efficiently, then that will count as a reduction in American Airlines Scope 1 emissions, but it'll also be a reduction in emissions from Exxon for Scope 3 and for Pratt & Whitney for Scope 3. So we've got a major issue of double counting here. How do we deal with this? The um, <clears throat> only real solution to this is to focus on Scope 1 and focus only on Scope 1. And if you think about it, every emission has to be a Scope 1 emission for some company. Or, and there's a, there's a footnote there that says also, uh, it could be a, foot, a Scope 1 emission for households or for governments. For the moment, I'll focus on companies, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so if we add up all Scope 1 emissions, it captures all emissions. Now, Scope 2 emissions are clearly duplicative of utility emissions, and some fairly simple math shows that the sum of all downstream Scope 3 emissions is the same as the sum of all Scope 1 emissions. So that's duplicative. And as some of the examples show, the upstream Scope 3 emissions are also duplicative. So what we have to do then is just focus on Scope 1. Uh, now, what we have to do, to, we have to add to the corporate Scope 1 an equivalent measure for, uh, for households and for governments, and for all levels of governments. Governments here means federal governments, state governments, municipal governments. Um, we also have to think about how to handle emissions from products that are exported or from inputs that are imported. Okay, so those, those will not be captured in Scope 1. Um, now, if we're just focusing on U.S. emissions, which is what we normally are, we can forget the, the uh, emissions from imports or exports, uh, although we do need to think about those if we're looking at global emissions. Uh, in order to, uh, to deal with the first point, uh, emissions from households and governments, we need to construct an equivalent of Scope 1 emissions for the household sector and for the various government sectors, and then add these into the total of Scope 1. So the bottom line here is that the only corporate emissions that matter are scope one. Others are completely duplicative and can be neglected. And we have to add to the sum of scope one emissions the equivalents for households and governments. And these would involve, for example, households and governments burning gasoline produced by Exxon. So for example, if I have a car and I burn Exxon gasoline in my car, then that's a scope one emission for me. If I happen to have a private plane and I burn Exxon's jet fuel in my private plane, well, then that's a scope one emission for me, and so on. Um, these are scope three emissions for Exxon that are not duplicated by any corporate scope one, uh, but they are they are duplicated by household and government scope one. So as long as we can construct a scope one for households and governments, then just adding up scope one is fine. Now, in fact, all the data we need to do this is available. Uh, and at Columbia Business School, we have in fact used data from the Environmental Protection Agency for facility level emissions data for corporations. We've used data from the Energy Information Agency on household consumption and household emissions of greenhouse gases. And we've used data from the Energy Information Agency on government emissions. And with this data, we've been able to construct a complete set of scope one accounts. So we've got estimates of scope one emissions for all corporations, for households and for the government. So we can produce a consistent set of accounts on this basis. An interesting question is why scope three and scope two persisted for such categories for so long because they are essentially redundant from the perspective I'm taking here. And the answer is that you know, whether you need scope two and scope three depends a little bit on what you want to do with your emissions data, what, what your aim is. Uh, scope two and scope three are part of an approach that seeks not so much to measure total emissions, but to attribute to a corporation as great a level of emissions as possible, to attribute to a corporation all of the emissions that could conceivably be associated with it. Now, scope two emissions are clearly the primary responsibility of a power producer or a utility, and they're their scope one. But there is a sense in which there would be no power production 
if there were no power user. So they can think of the company as indirectly responsible for its scope two emissions. So in that sense, they are associated with the company. Um, scope three emissions from Exxon's gasoline, again, are primarily the responsibility of the airlines or the auto owners, owners or the truckers. But again, there's a possible indirect responsibility for, for Exxon in the sense that if no one produced the gasoline, then it couldn't be used. But you can turn that argument around too and say, well, if nobody used it, it wouldn't be produced. Um, so the um, <clears throat> you know, scopes two and three are essentially redundant, but there is a difference between accounting for carbon so as to understand the total flows in the economy and the contribution to total emissions, which is what we need to do for policymaking, and accounting in a way that shows the maximum that can be attributed to corporations. Uh, and that may well have been part of the goal of the environmental groups that originally in, in developed the scope one, scope two, scope three framework. And the second thing I want to talk about, just very briefly now, <clears throat> is accounting for carbon offsets. A corporation is said to have gross zero emissions if it has no carbon emissions at all. It has net zero, it is at net zero, or has net zero emissions, if it has emissions, but these emissions are somehow compensated for or offset by some other activities. So the question I want to talk about is, what does it mean to compensate for slash offset a company's emissions? So here's a, a simple example to get us thinking about this. Imagine a company that produces a million tons of carbon dioxide a year. Then it starts up a plant that sucks a million tons of carbon dioxide a year out of the atmosphere and disposes of it permanently in some way. We don't worry for the moment about how it does this. Is this company net zero? It certainly looks like it ought to be, right? It's producing a million tons of CO2 a year, and then that goes into the atmosphere, and then it's taking a million tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, so why could it not be net, net zero? Well, one possibility is that the power plant, that the plant that removes CO2 from the atmosphere would have operated anyway and removed the CO2, even if the company had done nothing. So in that case, the plant could not be said to be compensating for the company's emissions, be a failure of what we call additionality in this context. Now, if the capture of CO2 from the air is really additional, something which would have not have happened if it were not for the company's intervention, then the company is carbon neutral. Um, and the uncomfortable point here is that whether we have an offset or not depends on a counterfactual or a baseline, um, which we need to measure from. And we need to make that counterfactual office as robust and as obvious as possible. With that proviso, air capture of CO2 is a very good offset. Uh, and we just have to confirm that the air capture would not have ca happened if it were not for the transaction generating the offset. <clears throat> now, another much more straightforward and much more popular form of offset is paying someone to plant trees. If you look at, for example, Microsoft, uh, the many of the offsets that they're, uh, they're claiming to use are offsets from forestry. They're paying people to plant trees, and trees, of course, as they grow, absorb CO2. So that's taking some CO2 out of the atmosphere to compensate for what Microsoft is emitting. Now, there are some issues with this. Uh, one, of course, is the trees grow very slowly. They absorb very little CO2 in the early years. So in the picture there, you've got a, a small tree. A tree that size doesn't absorb very much CO2. Um, <clears throat> It's probably five, the tree has to be out there for five or 10 years before it really starts absorbing CO2. So you can't really claim that trees are absorbing your CO2 today, or they will absorb CO2 in the future. Now, the bigger issue is that, that uh, trees can burn and release any CO2 that they've stored. In fact, an awful lot of the trees that have been planted as offsets uh, on the West Coast have been burned in some of the fires on the West Coast in the last couple of years and they released all the CO2 that was supposedly stored as offsets. A uh, more subtle issue is that uh, if you maybe you cause a thousand trees to be planted in some location, and at the same time someone cuts down a thousand trees nearby, have you actually caused a removal of CO2 from the atmosphere? In fact, because the opposite has happened, CO2 has actually been released into the atmosphere. But again, you can make an argument it would have been worse if it weren't for not, were not for your actions. So again, there's a counterfactual issue coming up again there. Um, the mechanism of this, suppose that a US corporation wants to buy an offset from Brazil. Then for this offset to be what we call Paris compliant, compliant with the Paris Agreement of 2015, Brazil has to keep national carbon accounts 
which meet UN FCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change standards. And these accounts must show a reduction in emissions. And the reduction in emissions must be at least as great as the sum of all offsets companies are buying from Brazil. So that's, those are conditions for, the, uh, uh, for an offset to be Paris compliant. Very, very few offsets are Paris compliant, of course. Most of the offsets being currently being traded in the voluntary offset market are not Paris compliant and don't meet this standard here. But there are some that do. <clears throat> now, the UNFCCC at its Paris meeting, and then also again in the subsequent Glasgow meeting, devoted many hours to the issue of what is a legitimate offset and what is an offset consistent with the Paris Agreement. And they don't use the word offset, and simply they call, they use the phrase ITMO, or Internationally Transferred Mitigation Outcome. Um, and in order for, a, for an offset or an ITMO to be valid, you have to be able to demonstrate that it's additional. That is, as I say, it represents a, a removal of CO2 from the atmosphere, which would not have occurred were it not for the transaction underlying it. Um, then, as I just indicated, the country where the offset is created must have national carbon accounts consistent with the UNFCCC standards, and these must show a reduction in emissions greater than or equal to the claimed offsets. And I just remarked, very, very few offsets in the voluntary market meet these conditions. Let me make a final remark on offsets before I wrap up altogether. Um, <clears throat> we want the world as a whole to have zero emissions somewhere in the second half of the century. <clears throat> now, the world can't have zero emissions if any company is using offsets, unless these are air capture offsets. <clears throat> so no offsets other than air capture could be allowed in the long run. Why is that? That's because suppose two companies, A and B, both produce a million units of emissions a year, and A pays B to reduce its emissions to zero, buying the right to claim this reduction as an offset. So you've got a situation now where B has reduced its emissions from one million units a year to zero, and then that's created an offset, and A has purchased the offset. So B is, B is gross zero, it's producing no emissions. A is net zero, uh, because it's producing a million units of emissions a year, but it's bought a million units of offsets. Um, so A is net zero, B is zero, but the world is neither. The world is still producing a million units of, of CO2 a year because A is still producing a million units of CO2 a year. And indeed, the whole purpose of an offset is to allow you to continue to produce emissions. So unless those emissions are removed from the atmosphere, which means you've got an air capture uh, offset, uh, then uh, we don't have, uh, we don't have, we're not actually at zero. So the bottom line there is that we have to have uh, offsets, either either no offsets or only air capture offsets in the long run. So overall conclusions from this discussion. If we want to measure total emissions and drive these to zero, we're interested in scope one emissions only. Everything else is duplicative. But we must have household and government scope one, as well as corporate scope one, and those are not currently recorded. <clears throat> and offsets are problematic. It is very rare that we can, with certainty, claim that these are real, real reductions in net emissions. And offsets other than air capture have to be zero if total emissions are going to be zero. Okay, thank you very much for your attention, and that's my last remark.